Welcome to Asahwa's podcast, encouraging revival of the mind and the heart, seeing the truth and standing for what is right in the age of overloaded misinformation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you all. And I am so happy that you're with us today for the fourth episode. This is your host, Othman Abu Mike. And I'm so glad that you could join me in this series that we are doing in regards to the current situation and understanding the history of the current situation of Israel and Palestine. Now, as I did promise you, today we are going to be speaking about the two-state solution. Is it possible for there to be a two-state solution? When did the idea of the two-state solution come about? And how was this two-state solution to be seen? How is it to be seen? How would it physically happen? But before we talk about that, let's just recap on the last few episodes. And I know it's a difficult subject to give justice to. And obviously... I am going to be biased on one side. I'm admitting it from the very beginning. And I'm trying my best to be balanced as possible. I am trying to bring out the facts. And obviously my personal feelings are coming out at the same time. And that's, hey, that's just me. I'm I'm a human being. I am going to feel it. And I'm sure those are opposite to my understanding and to my opinion are also going to be biased. And they will have the same sort of feelings to what they believe in. So let's just do a quick recap. We've already established that there was no Jewish state or Jewish rule for just around 1900 years or just under 1900 years. 1,817 years, I think it's something like that. But let's just round it off and say 1800 or 1900, whatever figure you are happy with. Let's go and say 1800. There was no Jewish state or land or rule by Jews in that region of Palestine, and I mean the whole of Palestine, what you call Israel, which is occupied Palestine. Absolutely no rule for 1,800 years. But during that time, or just before that, during the time of the Romans, the Jews were displaced. And we do not, absolutely, we do not refute that at all. That the Jews had been living there for a very long time. They had many dynasties in and around the region. And they were forced to leave their home, their communities, their synagogues, their religious places. And they fled from the area. They left the area, majority. There was a small number of a Jewish community that resided within, and they stayed there throughout those years. Many of them became slaves, i.e. to the Romans, or they were sold as slaves, and many, many fled. And the proof of this is when we speak about when the Jews were returning, we will mention where they returned from, and we have mentioned it already. But many of these Jews went to different parts of the world. And those Jewish communities, especially living in places like England, Russia, during the 16th, 17th century, some even say 15th century, were again persecuted and forced out of those areas where they took asylum from. And in Spain, in Muslim Spain, where they lived in peace and harmony with the Muslim, and they excelled in those areas, they were also forced out during the Spanish Inquisition, including the Muslims as well. And they found asylum in the Muslim lands, such as North Africa and in Istanbul or in present-day Turkey. Now, it is suggested that the idea of the Jews having a homeland or a Jewish homeland around Palestine, in Palestine, 
came around the 16th, 17th century. And Napoleon was one of them who suggested that. And the reason why he suggested it is because when he took over Egypt, he wanted direct access to the Middle East. And how would he do that? By taking what was at that time Ottoman territory, Palestine, and by placing a Jewish community there under his watch, under his governance, would then give him access straight to the Middle East. And obviously we know that didn't happen. But the idea of a Jewish homeland had been floating around for a very, very long time and there is no doubt of this at all. But the father of this idea eventually to become a state we mentioned was Theodor Herzl, who was from present-day Austria. And he came up with this idea of having a political Jewish state. And he went to the Kaiser of Germany, he went to the Sultan of the Ottomans and both of them rejected his claim and his ideas. So he went to the British and they came with an idea of the Uganda project which was kind of like East Africa really, Kenya. They were even offered places like Madagascar and even places in South of America. But this did not take place as the Zionist movement voted against it and they felt that it wouldn't be right for the Jewish community. But then the world witnessed a mass migration to Palestine during the latter part of the Ottoman Empire in the 1880s Many Jews from Europe, majority came from Europe. They came with European names like Theodor Herzl, not much of a Jewish name really, but they came from Europe, majority of them. And in their thousands they came, as we've already mentioned in the previous episodes. So the Ottomans gave them asylum and safety. When eventually the Ottoman Empire came to an end, Everybody was scrapping over the lands because the colonialists were in Africa, in India, had taken pieces already of the lands that were governed by the Ottoman Empire. Hence, the League of Nations decided the British would have a mandate. I could say it's more of an idea of saying the British are the ones who, who are going to be looking after Palestine during a X amount of time. I, can't, I don't know if it was actually agreed or not. But you had the Balfour Declaration where the King of Britain agreed in the declaration that the Jewish or the Jews will have a homeland. The very important thing to remember here the terminology that was used is very important because the agreement with the Palestinian Arabs was that because they are no longer under the rule of the Ottomans, they will be given an Arab state in Palestine. At the same time, the Jews were promised a Jewish homeland, not necessarily a state. During that time, the British allowed the migration of Jews coming to the land. Now, realistically, you're talking about majority of the Jews that are coming from Europe. Some Jews came from Iraq, Yemen, Saudi, or what is known as Saudi today, North Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, etc. So indigenously, these people were not from the region of Palestine. Because you hear about this argument that we the Jews have the right to be there because it's our ancestral home. We had been ruling there for many, many years, but we've already established you haven't been there for 1,800 years. The facts are there. Historians agreed this. The scholars agreed this. Even the Jewish scholars agreed this. For 1,800 years, that's a lot of years. 
there was no Jewish rule. There was no Jewish authority in the region of Palestine. That's absolutely clear. Nobody can dispute this. So the Jews were not returning. I, you know, you can't say the Jews were returning to the region of Palestine. They weren't returning. Because you're talking about generations who have lived and were born in a foreign country. Okay, you're talking about Jews who were born in Hungary, in Poland, in Germany, Austria, Romania, France. And they had names from those countries. They were not Hebrew names. And they came into Palestine for the sake of safety and asylum. And obviously, the false hope of having a Jewish homeland. Because who the hell, let's face it, who the hell is Britain to decide, I'm going to give a piece of a land that doesn't even belong to me, and here you go, you can have it. Can you imagine tomorrow, if the King of England, King Charles, His Majesty, turns around and says to Iceland, you can have Scotland. Because for whatever reason you're getting persecuted or where it is, you can have the Shetland Islands. It's all yours. No problem. Do you think the Scottish will listen to that? Do you think the Scottish would keep quiet? They wouldn't make a noise about it? That they wouldn't revolt? They wouldn't fight back? Of course. It, it's a natural thing to happen. Now, when the mass migration was happening in Palestine, obviously the Arabs... Palestinian Arabs were concerned that you've promised us an Arab Palestinian state where we are going to rule and you've promised a homeland to the Jews but now they are coming in mass numbers in 1935 the number of Jews in Palestine rose from something like 30 40,000 to 200,000 plus Obviously, they're going to be alarmed because for 1,800 years, the Jews have not lived there. They haven't governed there. Now, this mass migration is happening, coming into their land where they've lived there for now, for generations. You know, minus the period of when the Crusaders or the Christians had a kingdom in the region of Palestine and not the whole of Palestine. Now, obviously, the, the Palestinian Arabs are upset. So they resisted the British mandate. And from there we saw the birth of Jewish paramilitaries who were trained by the British, who became terrorist organizations. The British write it in their memos, in their letters to the British government. And they used these paramilitaries to quash the Arab revolt and the generals and the majors admitting themselves that these night squads, these gangs are conducting inhumane operations upon Arabs, but we're still going to use them anyway and nothing's working. So in return, when the British tried to appease the Arabs by reducing migration of the Jews coming into Palestine then those paramilitary groups like the Haganah decided now was the time to fight against the British they targeted British soldiers they targeted British civilian not just the population but the uh, the ones that are working for the government and it got to a point where the British had absolutely enough they just couldn't take it anymore the mandate absolutely collapsed and there was utter chaos there was threats from the neighboring Arab countries there was mayhem in the area where the British said right that's it we're done we're gone because you know what the British Empire has collapsed. We're losing territory all around the world, such as India, and a chaos day in 1947. We've got chaos happening in British territory in Africa. 
So you know what? We're done. We're out of Palestine. And they ran away and left it in the chaos. And who takes over? United Nations. Again, who is United Nations to suggest anything for their land? And so they decided we're going to make a map and divide this country. And the idea of a two-state solution came up. Numbers are disputed. But what they say is, even you can look at the old maps as well, and you will know and read for yourself that 60 to 70% of Palestine was to be given to the Jews who only made 35% of the population during that time, during the 1945-ish time. And the majority of the population will have a smaller number of 30 to 40%. What the world witnessed after that was the forced formation of the state of Israel in 1948. Now, don't forget, by this time, paramilitary groups like Haganah had now dissolved and become IDF, Israel Defense Force. The Israelis now switched from partnership with the British to countries like the USA because the USA is looking for their own strategic political, economic military viewpoint of entering the Middle East they're buying weapons from the United States they're buying weapons, weapons from countries like Czechoslovakia and their own production of weapons as well. There's major implications now upon the neighbouring countries such as Egypt, Syria Jordan, Lebanon and they are more or less in the sense of a state of war, continuous state of war, more or less. But during this time, the two-state solution didn't take place. There was no state for the Palestinian Arabs. And what do you think happened? We've mentioned before, the Palestinian resistance groups formed and they began fighting. And they took the roles like they did later on to be known as in South Africa, Vietnam and Ireland fighting the colonialist powers, trying to regain their land back, which they had been living on for hundreds of years. And during this time, which is evident and clear to the world, Israel committed many massacres which we had mentioned before, throughout this time, what has been the treatment of the Palestinians from Israel? Now, just imagine, you've got two areas now, Gaza and the West Bank. And just to put things into perspective, these two areas of Palestine became smaller and smaller and smaller. Any time... Israel was unhappy with the situation in Gaza, in West Bank, troops would enter. <laughs> you know what comes to my mind is when you hear the biblical stories of Goliath and David, and how did David beat Goliath was by catapult, by a stone, by a rock. And David was known biblically as someone who was smaller, frail, compared to Goliath. So looking at Palestine and Israel right now, who are the ones that are throwing stones? And who are the ones that are throwing bombs and bullets? So Israel would restrict places like Gaza and the West Bank because they were in control and they still are in control of water, electricity, and that's why it was the first thing the minister who said, these are human animals, we're going to cut off food, we're going to cut off water, we're going to cut off electricity, because they had already access, even money going to the Palestinian Authority in West Bank comes from, or released from who? Released from Israel. Palestinians don't have the right to be in safety because 
the IDF could enter these lands anytime they want and pick up whoever they want and have them in, de in detention indefinitely. So how could anyone say that Israel is the only democratic state in the Middle East? Doesn't make sense. If you're going to be democratic, you have to give equal rights to those that are living under your territory because you have occupied Gaza and the West Bank. But an Israeli citizen would never get treated the same as a Palestinian. An Israeli citizen cannot be held indefinitely in detention, yet a Palestinian can. A Palestinian kid, five-year-old child, can be accused of throwing a stone and be detained. And many human rights organizations have spoke about this, how children are detained under the age of 15, under the age of 13, without a parent or guardian. Without a parent or, parent or guardian. Can you imagine that happening in the UK? Can you imagine that happening in the US? Where the police roll up and say to a 10 year old kid, you need to come with us. You're going to go, uh, you're going to be questioned by yourself without your mum and your dad. That's just bizarre. No one would think of that. Even in Gaza, they are prohibited from collecting rainwater. Oh my God, it's just bizarre again. How is that possible? The rain is coming from the sky, from the heavens, and they are forbidden from collecting it. They can't even create wells in Gaza. They're also forbidden from, from that as well. So nobody can agree Israel is some sort of democratic country. It is not a democrat democratic country. Palestinians do not have the right to live with the same rights as the Israelis. Let me just quote you some statements because I want you to give some context to this idea of a two-state solution and if it's going to be possible. Now, Biden, I think they call him Genocide Joe, <laughs> Biden, he said, I think it was in the 70s and 80s, and it's a famous quote. We've seen it again and again on social media. If there wasn't an Israel, then we would create one. Now, that's quite a powerful thing to say. Why would you need, why is there a need to say such a thing? Because during that time, again, Biden mentioned this fact. They needed control, access to the Middle East. They had to make a friend. And it had to be a non-Arab, a non-Muslim they, that they can work with if they had to enter the Middle East. And who would keep the Arabs at bay would be a country such as Israel. And if Israel wasn't there, we would definitely, like, we would definitely produce one. And they have anyway. What about the Minister of National Security of Israel, Ben Gir? He said... My right, my wife's, my children's, to roam the roads of Judea and Samaria are more important than the right of movement of the Arabs. Now look what he done. He used a biblical term to the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. And we mentioned these two, these kingdoms, 1,800 years ago, even before that. So the link, again that he's a right-wing politician anyway, that they're all trying to make in regards to the possession, that they have like some sort of biblical right and biblical possession of the region of Palestine. What about the fin finance minister, Bazelin, who said, there is no such thing as a Palestinian people. No such thing as a Palestinian people. Can you imagine an MP saying to the Welsh, there's no such thing as Welsh people. <laughs> you don't exist. You're there, but you don't exist. You've been there for the last many hundred years, but really you don't exist. There'd be chaos in the UK. What about the minister of the far right, Otsma Yehudit party, Ali Yuha, who said, dropping a nuclear bomb on the Gaza Strip is an option. We wouldn't hand the Nazis humanitarian aid 
there is no such thing as uninvolved civilians in Gaza. Are we really thinking about that it's possible to have a two-state solution? If a ruling country, a ruling state, have these kind of politicians there? How about the rabbi, a rabbi, a religious person, a person, a scholarly person saying, and his name is Mia Maroz, if the people of Gaza were humans, we would have sent them humanitarian aid. But this is about animals. Again, we keep hearing how they describe the Arab Palestinians as animals. The Israeli heritage minister, Emichai Eliyahu, again says, anyone waving a Palestinian flag shouldn't continue living on the face of the earth. Wow. The threat of killing someone just because they're holding a flag. How crazy is that? Now, I know that this might be an old statement, but the Colonel Iyal Karim who was appointed in 2016 and he made a statement back in 2002 just imagine this he is the chief military rabbi I don't know if he still is now but he was in 2016 and he said rape is permissible in war on non-Jewish women now I'm just trying for you to understand the mentality of these people in charge, these ministers, these rabbis, chief military rabbi to say that non-Jewish women can be raped only in a time of war. What about Galit from the Likud, Likud party? He said, Gaza to be erased from the face of the earth. <laughs> Shocking, absolutely shocking to hear MPs, ministers of a state, a democratic state, the only democratic state in the Middle East, to say these shocking things and say that we are peaceful people, we haven't done nothing wrong. You know, why do Palestinians hate us? Comparing revolutionary groups or resistance groups to Nazis and I think that's an absolute insult to all those Jews who have died because of the Holocaust and due to the Nazis to even compare Nazis to these rebel groups is unbelievable unthinkable and damn right disgusting really the former Israeli Prime Minister Olmert He's on record on saying, if the day comes when the two-state solution collapses and we face a South African-style struggle for equal voting rights, then as soon as that happens, the state of Israel is finished. Wow, what a powerful statement to make. Now listen to what he's saying. He's saying, guys, if a two-state solution doesn't happen and it's just collapsed, we face a South African style struggle for equal voting rights. So is he comparing Israel to South Africa as an apartheid state? And is he admitting that the Palestinians don't have equal rights when it comes to voting? And he's definitely right when he says, then as soon as that happens, the state of Israel is finished because we've already established Israel was established upon a lie, an absolute lie, upon terrorism, upon chasing a people, expelling a people with no right to return. So, ladies and gentlemen, my dear brothers and sisters, there is only three options that we can put on the table. And I, at the end, will give you one option only. Number one, Israel takes the whole of Palestine 
And the only way that's going to happen is by expelling all the Palestinians or having a very, very, very small area for Palestine. Now, you can see on social media, Israelis talking about erase Gaza. We heard the minister say it. Let's make Gaza Jewish again. You know, historically speaking, even those areas of Gaza, Ashkelon, and as we said, Ashkelon and Ashdod and, and all these areas were actually under Philistine when the people of the Aegean Sea came and conquered those areas. So really and truly, those areas weren't even ruled by the Jews during you know some of the periods. It was like, like an independent state. Anyhow, that's a side note. So the Israelis can take over the whole of Palestine, and that's only going to happen if they expel the Palestinians, and that's always been their dream anyway. Let's, let's face it, eradicate Gaza, 700,000 Palestinians forced out and no right to return. Come on, let's be honest. We can see what's happening here. It's called ethnic cleansing. Or the second option, the Palestinians take over, and they allow the Jews and Christians to live as they did in the past during the Muslim rule. Nobody can doubt. I challenge anyone to prove to me, not during the time of war, but during the other times, during the time of peace, where Muslims were rolling, uh, ruling, where Muslims were ruling, and during that time, there were major massacres upon Jews or Christians living in Palestine during that time. I challenge anyone. Bring me any proof of massacres, and I'll tell you there were none. The third option is a two-state solution according to United Nations, not to the 1967 borders, to the borders of just before and after 1948. But really and truly, if you look at what's going on in Palestine right now and you think about the two-state solution, there is no religious right on Palestine. Come on, you can't quote to me the Bible and suggest to me that because it mentions in the Bible we have the right to take Palestine back because we have decided to come back after 1900 years or 1800 years and not decided to sorry yes we agree they were forced out and now we're coming back in numbers we have the biblical right now suddenly to take over our land okay and make it ours because it's ours and that's it and you've got to do what we say and that's it you have no rights you know who are you you're nothing you know we've proven who you are you're nothing at all you, you're dirt that's why we can bomb you that's why we can take you any time we want. Come on, realistically. There is no right about taking the land of Palestine just because you're a Jew or even an Arab. But the fact is, who was ruling as a state, as a kingdom, over the region of Palestine for the last 1800 years Prior to 1948, majority of that time, we can see, yes, was Romans. After the Romans, it was Muslim rule. There was a Christian kingdom for a small period. Then it went back to Muslim rule. So in the last five, six, seven, eight hundred years, just the last six, seven hundred years under Muslim rule majority and a small period of Christian rule. And the Christians and Jews that lived under Muslim rule, they lived in relatively harmony and peace. In conclusion, there can only be one ultimate solution. Either the Zionist state of Israel or a Muslim Republic of Palestine. But let's be honest 75 years later, the chaos in Palestine, in Israel, no one's going to agree to a two-state solution. It's just not going to happen right now. Maybe, maybe 
there might be a solution where there's a temp temporary truce for about 10 years, if that's possible. But with the agreement of pulling out the settlements, which was already mentioned in numerous United Nations resolutions, that all the settlements need to be removed from the West Bank, all of them, and go back to those particular borders of 1947, 1948, or 1948 onwards, according to the United Nations. And in that small period, Israel has no right to enter another country because that's what it's going to be. It's going to be a different state. We saw the way Israel in the 80s just entered Lebanon. These are international borders. You can't just walk into somebody else's country just because you feel like it. We see what they, we saw what the uh, you know the allies done in Iraq and Afghanistan and left it in chaos more than it was in before. And we saw during the seventies and the eighties how the Americans, when they decided that we're going to fight the communists, the socialists, they entered South um, uh, South America and the Far East and cause absolute chaos and carnage and rape and torture and the disappearance of gold and resources from these countries. So really and truly, America and the West have no right. They have no right whatsoever to lecture anybody else when it comes to the issue of peace and negotiations and, and uh, having some, some sort of stability because... They are the ones within the last hundred years who have caused instability in the world. That's the reality of it. We've seen it in the last 50 odd years. What's happening in Africa, thanks to the Western countries, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and now in Palestine. So, in conclusion, two-state solution, I doubt it very much. Not going to happen. There can only be one state solution. And who's going to win? Only God knows. Allahu Alam. These are points for you to ponder, to think about, do your own research, and then to make your own conclusion. It's not going to stop here. The bombing of Gaza is going to continue for a very long time. It's not going to stop here at all. The achievement of the Israelis is to make the population minimal as you can see they've already killed the next generation a lot of them 4,000 plus children dead they're not Hamas fighters how many Hamas fighters are dead how is it possible that you're able to negotiate hostages and those Hamas fighters are coming out from those tunnels and they are able to give the hostages back alive well treated yet you want to break the ceasefire or the ceasefire is over and now let's continue our bombing. Who are you bombing? Hamas? No, you're not. Who are you bombing? The Gaza infrastructure? Yes. Who are you bombing? Hospitals? Yes. Who are you targeting? Civilians? Absolutely. Who are you killing? The next generation. So I'm going to stop here now. Let me know of your feedback, of your comments. And to our next episode, our next discussion, we will be discussing effects of Zionism today, as in the Jewish Zionist lobbies and the war of social media. I will bring some of those examples up as well. So ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you very much for joining me today and hope to see you in the next episode and remember let's learn let's talk let's discuss let's engage god bless assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh